ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage Ronan Bergman and Brett Stevens. Uh, well, I overheard oh. a little bit of that introduction. Thank you, Jamie, <laughs> for uh, the, uh, the plug for my diet. Um, <laughs> for those of you who want to know my technique, it's called PTFD. It stands for put the fork down. <laughs> if, you, if you need the extra strength version, it's PTFFD. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we are uh, really privileged to have uh, on stage um, one of the uh, uh, greatest, uh, I was going to say Israeli journalists of our time, that's wrong, one of the greatest journalists of our time. Thank you. And that is Ronan Bergman. And he. Uh, Thank you. Thanks so much. He has a book which uh, I have in my hands and I hope all of you will have uh, in yours. Uh, it's an absolutely extraordinary account of um, some of Israel's uh, more secretive history, um, history of assassinations, targeted assassinations against the enemies of the Jewish state. It was 10 years in the making. And one of the things that for me, having been editor of the Jerusalem Post, I find so impressive is just the range, the breadth, the depth of his sources. When you, when you uh, perform journalism in Israel, what you find is that the people who are willing to speak know nothing, <laughs> and the people who know everything aren't willing to speak. And yet you have over a thousand sources here who are authoritative. So what I wanted to start by asking is, how do you get them to talk? I smile. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, thank you, um, Jamie, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really happy. Um, yesterday when we parked the car, Yana, my fiance, and I in the um, parking garage over there, I said, the fact that we are here is really supernatural, but it's, it's not supernatural. It's thanks to your help and the help of many others who help us, helping me getting the visa on time. And thank you, Brett, for your opening uh, remarks, these kind words. Um, I signed the contract with Random House in 2010. They asked me, how long will it take you? I said, a year. They said, well, why don't we, just to be in the safe zone, write a year and a half. I said, whatever, you can do whatever you like, but it's going to take me a year. I was six years delayed. <laughs> and, um, and the reason why it took me, the main reason why it took me so long was to was because I decided to basically put aside everything that was published about Israeli intelligence so far. This is not the first book um, or publication about the Mossad. I assume that you know, many of you have seen the movie Munich, you know, Steven Spielberg, um, famous movie and very good one about how the Mossad retaliated for the murder of Israeli athletes in uh, the 1972 Munich Olympics. Um, highly decorated, highly nominated for the Oscar, etc. This movie is one is, which is, for most American, whatever, everything that they know about the Mossad, this movie is 100% fake news. <laughs> there is nothing true in Munich. Steven Spielberg fell victim to a crook by the name of Juval Aviv, or Yuval Aviv as he's called. Uh, the uh, owner of a security firm in New York who claimed to be Avner, the chief of the uh, assassination team that killed the Palestinians, but as high as he got, the highest was the commander or the chief of a, of a baggage selector shift at Ben Gurion Airport. It was never in Mossad. And because everything that was published made no sense, was not referenced with no footnotes, I decided to start all over again and interview all the people again and try to get new, new stuff and getting what was already published in the right order because I think you cannot understand Israeli history without really understanding the history of Mossad every, or Israeli intelligence. Every event, every situation, they did good, they did bad. Sometimes the Israeli James Bond looks more like Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> but, but they were involved in every major operation and I think I, and I wanted to, to, to get them to talk. 
And beside of smiling to them, I think that the main reason, each one has his or her own reason why they spoke, but I think that the main, if there's a common ground, common reason, was that after so many years in the dark, after so many years in the secrecy zone, they wanted their story to come out. They wanted people to know what they have done to protect the citizens of Israel and the country. S some of them told me, I'm saying to you things that I, didn't, I never told my wife. Um, and they did that not in order to defend, because, you know, some of the operations described there, described in Rise and Kill First, could be seen as controversial, but they, they did what they did. They participated in these daring and sometimes um, problematic operations because they thought this is what they need to do in order to protect Israel. And they wanted to come out. They wanted to make sure that their footprint is set upright in history. And to conclude, if they didn't, or if they weren't too enthusiastic, I did to them the one thing that makes all Israelis um, go ballistic, furious. I told them that someone else took credit for their operation. <laughs> <laughs> that, that usually <laughs> solved the problem. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the... One of the conclusions the reader reaches uh, uh, at the end of the book is that uh, it's not so clear cut that the security of Israel has uh, benefited from uh, the range and reach of these operations, not only when they failed, but also even when they succeeded. That success itself in some of these operations has always been a bit of a, of a mixed bag. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Um, the bottom line is that Israeli intelligence is, I think, you know, a lot of respect to other intelligence communities, the Brits or the Americans, um, but I think that Israeli intelligence is one of the best, if not the best, intelligence community in the world because of necessity. Because I just told this to one former director of the CIA who asked him, what, what do I think is the difference between Mossad and the CIA? I think that from Mossad, for Shin Bet, the Israeli Domestic Secret Service, for all the intelligence community, what is happening is happening now. It's an immediate threat, or at least perceived as immediate threat. While for the CIA, Something happening in the other corner of the world can be wait can wait until until tomorrow. For Israelis, for Israeli intelligence, the threat is imminent. It's happening now, and now should be addressed. And this is what what made them so good. So Israeli intelligence, sooner or later, was able to present with a viable answer to any kind of challenge that the political level presented to it. They were able to throw out suicide bombers. We will speak about this later uh, to at least um, slow down, if not stopping, nuclear projects of the adversary. They were able to supply great intelligence coming from the adversary side. They were very successful. They were very successful in the, the goal that Ben-Gurion set for them. Ben David Ben-Gurion, the, I think the, probably the most important Jew in the last 1,000 years, Two. Even two. <laughs> Even maybe, you know, he's in the, in the League of Moses. <laughs> and a lot of respect to Benjamin Netanyahu, but still. <laughs> he established Israeli intelligence basically to do things. The one is to supply with sufficient information that would allow to mobilize the troops, mainly reserves duties, and send them to the border to wait for a preemptive strike from the enemy, something like 48 hours. But Israeli intelligence does much more than just bringing information. It is also translating that to special operations way beyond enemy lines. Mayor Dagan, the uh, legendary Mossad chief of the previous decade, told me the triumphant victory of the Six-Day War will not repeat itself. We should go to an all-out war only when the sword is on our neck. All the rest should be addressed by pinpoint operation way beyond, way beyond enemy lines, sabotage, um, 
um, malwares, viruses, computer viruses, targeted killers. And they were able, and was, so, so they were able to not just take the information, but all translate that to operations. The Mossad, the uh, organization that we all know, is in Hebrew called, the, the direct translation is, the Mossad is the institution. But the full name of the organization is the Institution for, Opera for Intelligence and Special Operations. So by its name, you understand this is very different from many other intelligence services in the West. Saying all that, the remarkable success of Israeli intelligence, and they were remarkable, I think, led the political level above them to get the wrong conclusion. They thought that in their hand, they have a powerful tool that would not just allow them to stop the next day suicide bomber or to prevent the Iranians from getting nuclear bomb, but also could satisfy them to do everything else, hold history by its tail, to replace any kind of other ways of diplomacy or statemanship or discourse with the, with, with the other side and satisfy with special operations. And therefore, I think that the, the remarkable success of Israeli intelligence are tactical, magnificent successes that saved many, many, many Israeli lives but can also, and I'm not talking just about the Netanyahu, I'm talking about all prime ministers, but can also lead to very dangerous strategic failures. So what you're saying is, in, in effect, that the reliance on a tool that is a tactical tool allowed Israeli policymakers to um, imagine that tactics could substitute for, uh, for strategy. Now, there have been notable failures in Israeli intelligence, not just, you mentioned 1967, a success, but then there's 1973. That's a, that, that is probably the biggest single blunder sure. in, in Israeli history. Why did that blunder come about? Well, we can have a talk just about the yeah. 73 war, but, but to, to put it um, uh, as a just a, in a summary, Israel felt as if, and spoke about this openly, as if the new Israeli, the third Israeli kingdom was erected after the Six Day War. You know, on the one day before the war, so on the 5th of October, 1973, Moshe Dayan was sitting with the cabinet and the chiefs of the military and the intelligence and said, I don't think that there's going to be war. But if there is war, the continuation of that sentence should have been mobilize the troops and recruit everybody you can. No, the continuation of that sentence was, please prepare the list of schnorr meaning the list of support and ammunition and sophisticated armory that we are going to ask the United States to supply us for not striking first. This, is what, this was his, his mindset. So his mindset was that we, there's no way that we are going to lose that war. He was so sucked into the belief that Israel could prevail in any way. And this was an intelligence blunder because the intelligence chiefs was, were part of that vision of the Israeli kingdom. They thought that the, the Egyptians will never dare to strike. And they perceived there were 1,026 different intelligence um, uh, telegrams, cables, suggesting war is imminent, and they ignored all of them. Now, of course, you can also go to the details, but the bottom line is that they missed, while they, they saw a lot, but they missed the understanding of the other side that the only thing Sadat wanted was not to destroy Israel or conquer the whole of the Sinai Peninsula. What he wanted to do is destroy the Israeli hubris. What he wanted to do is have small Egyptian military present at, the, at our side of the Suez Canal, kill as many Israeli soldiers as possible, destroy that, moving his um, uh, reliance from the Soviet Union to the United States, his secret negotiation with Kissinger, and leading Israel to negotiation table would give up on the Sinai Peninsula. He s was remarkably successful, and in that sense, he understood Israel more, much, much better than Israel or Israeli intelligence understood Sadat. Let's, let's move towards towards the present here, because I think people are, are interested in, in a couple of things in particular. Um, the first is 
uh, Israeli intelligence vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Palestinians and the extent to which targeted assassinations have helped Israel in its struggle against Hamas, uh, the radical elements of Fatah, the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, and terrorist elements of Fatah. Um, uh, talk to us a little bit about the success side, but also the, the costs, because it seems, I mean, you, you, you take the view that it, it's not altogether, you know, a, a story of, of, of pure achievement. We are talking about different eras and different generations, but in, in general, Israel was highly successful fighting the secular Palestinian terrorism, so the PLO. Um, the PLO was corrupt, um, and Israel found it relatively easy to recruit agents and then launch campaigns of targeted killings that diminished PLO capability to work against Israel. I mentioned the movie Munich. Um, so what everybody saw in that movie is not, uh, is not real, but what actually happened was that just be before Munich, Mossad was killing Palestinians, but it did that only in Arab countries. Mossad officials came to Prime Minister Golda Meir, you know, uh, a citizen of Milwaukee, and, <laughs> and asked her for permission to kill Palestinians in Europe. They said to her, Mrs. Prime Minister, we supply the European intelligence services with everything they need. They know that Palestinian operatives, Palestinian terrorists are activating on their country, on their soil, and they do nothing because they want to pretend neutral to the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. Please allow us to kill, them, to kill them in Europe. And she said no, until Munich. She said no, stand down. I do not authorize this because these are friendly countries who negotiate with Mossad. They will never allow us to kill Palestinians on their, on their uh, territory. On on their territory. Um, and if, if we ask permission, if we don't, they severe diplomatic relations with Israel. Munich changed that. It changed not because Palestinians killed athletes in Europe, as, 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 as tragic as it was. Because of, it changed because of the incompetency of the Germans. The chief of Mossad, who was the only one allowed to present, to, to see what happened, and he saw the Israeli athletes being burnt on the German helicopters, he came back. And he told the cabinet that he asked the Germans to stop the Olympic Games, and they said, we don't have anything to broadcast on television. <laughs> and he asked the Germans to have Israeli commando, Sayeret Matkal, the uh, uh, high elite commando unit with Ehud Barak, to intervene, and they did not allow. And that he saw the Israelis burn, and the, the, the Germans are also injured, that the SWAT, the German SWAT team that was supposed to take lead in the rescue operation convened just a few minutes before and said, we are not going to risk our lives for the Israelis. And they went away. And so Munich changed a lot in the sense that after Munich, Israel started to assassinate or kill Palestinian terrorists wherever it could. You, you rather wish that the Germans had been this incompetent 30 years earlier. Yeah, well, uh, of course. <laughs> sure. The, the Los Angeles Times yeah. um, described the scene where the Olympic game continues while the Germans are trying, or well, not, not really trying, but the Israelis are being burned on the helicopters as, quote, like dancing in Dachau. Um, and Golda Meir changed their policy and ordered Mossad to start killing Palestinians in Europe. And that changed the lot because Yasser Arafat and his deputy, Khalil al-Wazir Abu Jihad, realized that it just doesn't worth it to continue to operate in Europe and reconcentrate to the Middle East where it was much easier for Mossad to, to hit them. So throughout, this is just one example where targeted killings have been very much effective. And throughout the time, Israel was able to diminish, not to completely destroy, but to diminish Palestinian terrorism to a very low degree. But while doing that, they missed the big, the big, the big development. This was the Intifada, the popular uprising. They didn't see from many, many trees, they didn't see the forest. The Palestinians went to demonstrate in masses. That caused Israel a, a much larger damage than any terrorism could do. And at the end of the day, forced the Rabin government to sign the Oslo Accord and create what was the beginning of the two-state uh, two solution. Israeli intelligence was by far less successful with 
the jihadist terrorism, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, until a much later time when they recovered and were able to stop was for a very, very long time considered to be unstoppable, suicide terrorism. How do you stop a person who is willing to die, is wearing the suicide belt, and is going to explode aboard a bus or, or in, inside a, a shopping mall? And the only way that they could stop that was by using targeted killings. They, by using a lot of targeted killings. A lot. This was the most extensive campaign of targeted killing ever launched in history. And they did not target the suicide bombers. Hamas boasted that they have more volunteers than suicide belts. They target the layer above them, the bomb makers, the coordinators, the regional commanders, the indoctrinators, the communicators. Once they started to kill these people, it proved to be very effective. Now, now the person who gave that order was uh, Arik Sharon, the late, mm -hmm. the late prime minister. He was prime minister when I was living in Israel. And he's a major figure in your, in your book. And so talk to us a little bit about Sharon and his evolution, also in terms of his view uh, of the Mossad and of his view and, and, and the security services, and as well as the, his view of the conflict with the Palestinians. So Arik Sharon was uh, you know, the, 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 the hawk of the hawkish. Um, and advocated by throughout most of his time in the he military. He too could have used the PTFD diet, but that's... Yeah. That's a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, a go short, ahead. A short story about that. <laughs> Sharon comes to the... It, this is 2002, and he's invited to speak with Chirac, President Chirac at the Elysee Palace. And Chirac was furious about Israel, for, about many things, but especially about the use of Israel in these massive campaign of targeted killing. So Sharon asked the deputy chief of the Shin Bet, Israeli Internal Domestic Secret Service, to come and explain to the French president why this is important. So Sharon sits here, Chirac sits here, Chirac speaks all the time, and people are bringing, the waiters are bringing the food to Sharon. <laughs> and he sees the food, but the president is speaking, so he cannot start eating. So he whispered in Hebrew, to Mr. Diskin, who is the deputy chief of Shin Bet, he said, Yuval, that's his first name, Yuval in Hebrew, start speaking, I'm hungry. <laughs> so, so, Diskin said in Hebrew, this is all whispering in Hebrew, he said, but Prime Minister, the, the president is speaking, I cannot. He said, what, and what do you want me to speak about? He said, I don't care, just do something <laughs> speaking, I'm starving here. <laughs> so then, this can well, it was the Elysee, so the food was probably pretty <laughs> decent. But. So he starts <laughs> speaking, and he gives the president just a very recent example of someone that they targeted killing just a week before, someone that was planning to send another wave of suicide bombers to Israel. When he, finish, when he finishes, the president says, well, you know what? Now that you spoke, it looks different according to what you ex just explained, then from 4,000 miles away. Two weeks afterwards, and he changed his tone, not about the Israeli occupation, but the, 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 the question of, of using targeted killing. Two weeks afterwards, Sharon goes to meet President Putin at the Kremlin. He invites Mr. Diskin again and says to him, do the same spiel to Putin. <laughs> they stand outside of the, the main hall where they were supposed to come. They, are, they have wine in their hands. So... Sharon introduces Diskin to Mr. Putin, President Putin. Then he says, now Mr. Diskin will explain to you why is it so important for, you, for us to use targeted killing. And Diskin starts the same story all over again. After two sentences, President Putin stopped him and said, I don't care, you can kill them all. Let's go and have something to eat. <laughs> okay. So each president and his different style. Since we're on the subject of targeted killings, I want you to take us through one of them, which was um, notable in its time, which was the uh, assassination of Imad Mugnia. Can we talk right. about that and just tell the audience who he who, was? Who is Imad? Yeah. So Imad Mugnia is the devilish, legendary, in a way, in a very negative way, military commander of Hezbollah. Hezbollah, the Shiite Iranian proxy, considered to be the most important important or the most powerful terrorist organization ever existed on the face of the earth. Nowadays, just to give an example, nowadays Hezbollah holds 
the capability to launch something around 130,000 rockets and missiles on Israel. That's a, a, an ability that is being held by few countries around, like all over, all over the globe. Imad Bonia was wanted by 41 different countries. He bombed the American embassy in Beirut in 1983, the American Navy barracks. He killed hundreds of uh, the French barracks. He killed hundreds of Americans and Israelis and Saudis and French and Brits. He was a phantom. There was a picture of him, one, one picture of him from 1983. And throughout 26 years, the longest manhunt in history, no one could get even close to him, not to speak about killing him. Mayor Dagan was appointed by Ariel Sharon to be the chief of Mossad in uh, 2002. When, they, when he appointed him, Sharon, Dagan, it, Sharon knew Dagan because he, when Sharon was the commander of the Israeli Southern Front in the 70s, Dagan was 26, and Sharon asked him to run a special squad of special uh, group of, of um, assassins uh, killing Palestinian terrorists in, in Gaza. So when he appointed him in 2002, he said, Mayor, I want you to create a Mossad with a dagger between the teeth. And I met Sharon back then. And you know, Sharon was famous to be impolitically correct. And bear in mind, um, you know, this is Israeli humor. And I asked him, I said, Mr. Mr. Prime Minister, do you really think that Mayor Dagan famous to be a rogue officer, trigger happy, you know, he will, br will he bring Mossad to the glorious times? It's one thing to be leading a, a, a group of a team of assassins in Gaza and another to, to lead an organization of thousands of people all over the world. And he said, Ronan, I'm sure Mayor will bring back the glorious time of Mossad. You, and you know why? You know what is Mayor's greatest expertise? And I said, why? Although I expected some sort of macabre humor. He said, Mayor's best expertise is how to separate a terrorist from his head. <laughs> Dagan came to, I was told never to say this story to an American, so sorry. <laughs> but, but, you know, I feel, I feel that you will be a, a good audience for that. Um, <laughs> Dagan was a, w came to be Mossad chief and hanged on the wall behind him a photograph, a black and white photograph of a religious Jew standing on his knees with his hand in the air with a terrified look and two Gestapo officers pointing their rifle at him, laughing. And he said to everyone coming to his office, including to Michael Hayden, then the chief of the CIA, he said, look at this picture. This is my grandfather, Dov Ehrlich, at the Polish ghetto of Lokov in 1942, just seconds before these Gestapo bastards shoot him to death. And I am here as Mossad chief, and we are here to make sure that this will never happen again. Jews will never kneel. There will never be another annihilation. <laughs> and I asked, I asked Dagan, just shortly before he died, he gave a series of interviews to the, to the book. And I said, Mayor, what was the most important operation that, that you think you did? And he said, there was one thing I preached to everybody around me from the minute I entered Mossad. And here I go to Mossad jargon, because Mossad has special code name for targeted killing. They call it negative treatment. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's worse than a bad book review. <laughs> so he said, I said, I told everybody, we need to deliver negative treatment to Morris. Morris was the code name for Imad Munia. Now, not spoiler reading, it's all in chapter 34. <laughs> but, but Mossad were, were able, after two years of efforts, to trace down Mounia, not in Beirut, where they expected him to be, but in Damascus. Because in Damascus, at that time, before the Civil War, he felt much secure, with a very strong secret police and under the hospices of, of, of Syrian intelligence. They knew where he is, 
using few safe houses run by the Iranian intelligence in Damascus, but they didn't, but they couldn't get to him. It was very hard for Mossad, you know, using false disguises, etc. Very, very complicated. They needed help. So Prime Minister Olmet flew to Washington to speak with President Bush and said, please, President, authorize the CIA to help us. There is something that you have in Damascus that we don't, an embassy. <coughs> embassy gets you diplomatic cover. You can send everything by diplomatic mail. Much, much easier to work. Still very complicated. The president said, OK, one condition, no collateral damage. Munia and only Munia is dead. And I want your guys to show my guys how the bomb works and making sure that not the girls in the nearby school, so nearby the, the Iranian safe house, and not anyone else is hurt, only Munir. They assembled a special bomb at where usually the, 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 the spare wheel of a Pajero jeep is held with explosive uh, filled with uh, small tungsten balls. They, when the bomb explodes, the tungsten balls have special uh, angle, creating a killing zone. Whoever enters the killing zone is dead. Whoever is outside of that is alive. And they were sending the, this is a very complicated operation, again, CIA and Mossad together in Damascus, trying to get even for everything he did. And they had the Pajero following Mounia all over Damascus for months, 53 times. They had the finger on the button, almost killing him, and standing down because of various reasons. Just, and almost giving up. So, you know, one time, January 2008, stormy day in Damascus. They see someone getting out of the safe house. He walks like Munir. He even talks like Munir over the phone. But when he gets close to the killing zone, he see, they see that it, he, he's the same height like Munir, but all of his face, because it's so cold, are, are covered with a scarf. So the guy with his finger on the button says, Chief, to the commander of the, of, the, of the war room, do I have permission to engage? He said, no, no, stand down. We are not sure it's him. Too dangerous. <coughs> Genu sorry, February 12, 2008, sunny day in Damascus, Munir gets out of the safe house, walking towards the killing zone. The Pajero is in location. they just about to press the button. And they, then someone says, no, 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 do not engage. He's with someone. He's with a man. And the man is Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Al-Quds force of the Iranian Revolutionary Brigade. He's now running the front against Israel in Syria, from Syria, against Israel and the United States from Syria. They call Olmert, and Olmert said, do not engage. I promise President Bush that only Munir is killed. And then, that evening, Munir goes alone from the safe house. He's identified. They press the button, and he's killed. And two, day, two weeks later, Prime Minister Olmert arrives to the, to the White House, gets out of the limo, and surprisingly, he finds Vice President Cheney standing the, at the tip of the lawn, saluting, uh, you know, uh, giving gratitude in, in, on, on behalf of the American people for closing that account. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I, I don't know who did that. I can only say that, and again, these are Israelis, not politically correct. The, the day he was killed, I get a call from Mossad source who said, Ronan, we got him. Morris is dead. And I ask, wonderful. I, I, I didn't believe in the I said, wonderful, but why your voice is so heavy? So he says, what a pity, what a shame. It was a brand new Pajero. I was no longer in Israel on the day he was on when the news came that he was um, I was no longer in Israel when the news came that he was uh, was killed but a former colleague of mine was in the Knesset cafeteria that day and he said he saw the prime minister and I said well what did he look like and he said he was wearing a shit eating grin quote unquote <laughs> so we, we, we felt we knew the authorship of that operation. This is not all in your book, but I think the audience is going to, to really be interested. 
Israel has conducted, the Mossad has conducted a series of operations in Iran, the targeted assassination of scientists, the Stuxnet virus, and more recently, um, and this came too late for your book, but I know that you're, you're, you've written about this for, for the New York Times, um, the incredible heist of voluminous amounts of information from a warehouse in Tehran documenting the history of Iran's secret nuclear weapons program. And we've seen pictures of this information and it was stored in what seemed to be at least a dozen very heavy, very safe uh, vaults. vaults. How the hell did the Mossad do that? <laughs> Well, right, you know, um, only in the movies you have figures like James Bond who do everything by themselves. So he comes to Ems, the chief of the MI6, he explains, he analyzes the information, he hacked the computer, he jumps from roof, he rides the Aston Martin, he flies the helicopters, <laughs> he shoots the bad guys, and he comes home in time having sex with the most beautiful lady and <laughs> drinking martini, shaken but not stirred. <laughs> but this is... But this is only in the movies. <laughs> putting, putting sex aside, I'm not here to speak about that. Um, <laughs> the, the real life of the real intelligence operative or officer is a differentiation between the many, 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 many ex expertise that James Bond does by himself. But in real life, this, it is done by many, many people. The, the operation that you just mentioned, was conducted with the participation of no less than 500 people in Mossad. Of course, at the end, there were only 18 at the warehouse. But just to give an example how complicated that was, back in time, Iran signed the JCPOA, the controversial Iran nuclear agreement, in the summer of 2015. Now, they realized that soon after, the inspectors of the IAEA, the agency, um, in charge of the enforcement of the non-proliferation treaty, will come to their archive looking for the material documenting the project that they denied ever existed. So instead, so they had two, uh, two choices. One of them is to say, well, we are not going to use it anyway, so shred the documents. But they had other plans in mind. So instead of shredding them, they relocated them to a deserted warehouse at the outskirts of Tehran putting very little security detail around it, so no, not to not attract attention as if the place is important, telling only six people over, all over Iran what is in the vaults, trusting their loyalty. Well, apparently one of them was not that loyal, because <laughs> Mossad learned about that, and for two years planned the operations. Now, you mentioned something very important, the vaults, because the, the, the folders were stashed in 32 thick vaults, and once the operatives are inside the warehouse, they have only five and a half hours to drill in, take the documents, and run away. That's not enough time to figure out how to open them. So Mossad created a cover front company in Paris, dealing with some, some sort of, of real estate, who ordered two safes, empty safes, from the same Tehran manufacturer, same factory, flown them to Paris, flown them to Israel, to Mossad labs, where they started to drill into them, trying to figure out what is the fastest way to open them. These are very thick vaults. It turned out that you need at least a heat of at least 2,000 degrees centigrade, which is like 3,600 Fahrenheit, in order to open them. So just imagine what sort of energy you need to schlep with you to Tehran <laughs> to create such energy. This is horrendous. <laughs> and in four different places to make yeah. it on time. So they drilled down, they opened that, they, they went in at uh, half past 11 in the um, uh, PM, and they needed to get out no later than one minute before five o'clock, 5 a.m., because they knew that at seven o'clock the guard would come back and he will sound the alarm. Now imagine that moment, seven o'clock in the morning, the guard, the sleepy guard, who thought it's just a regular routine and doesn't even know what's there, he comes. He sees everything open. Someone just stole the dirtiest secrets of the Ayatollah regime under their noses. He sounds the alarm. 
and no less than 12,000 troops, Revolutionary Guard policemen, trying to chase the Mossad, but they chased the wind. They don't even know who did that. They assumed it was the Mossad. And they stole the original documents. They didn't photocopy, they just stole it. And only in April 30, Prime Minister Netanyahu gave them the confirmation that their worst fear is true. Mossad has stole their documents. And now if they want to have the original, they have to apply to Mossad chief archivist and ask. <laughs> wow. Listen, we have five minutes left, and I do want to allow at least a couple questions from the audience. So um, make them good and uh, raise your hands if you have a question. Um, Helene. Well, I'm concerned about what I'm concerned what I'm reading now about um, what's going on in Israel um, with the Palestinians. I think they're getting worse from what we're reading. They're, they're more organized, and they're more. Fr I'm more frightened about what the future is with the, Israel with the Palestinians. Do you have any feelings about that, or do you think we are in the same page, or how do you feel we're really The question is. Um, uh, there are worries that the situation with the Palestinians is getting worse, that they're more organized, Israel less so. Um, how does Ronan? Well, I, I think it? that, and maybe this is counterproductive because you know, I, I'm writing about bad people doing bad things and what the good guys are doing against them. But I think that Israel is in the best security position it has been for many, many years. Um, which is, you know, sometimes we journalists might deliver good news, not only the bad ones. Um, just 20 years ago, the, the worst case scenario, the, the nightmare scenario for the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces generals, was that the joint force of both the Iraqi and the Syrian Defense Forces go together to war against Israel. They had together 54 armed tank divisions. And so Israeli generals really feared that they would just start rolling. Nowadays, both threats do not exist anymore. There is no real Syrian army and no real Iraqi army. We deal with low intensity conflict. These are, these are serious threats and Iran is serious threat. But I think that we are enjoying a relative much better time than, than we used to. Now, to your question, I did not miss... I didn't, I didn't quite finish that question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> my, point, my, my point really was what's going on in the States with vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians. All of the schools seem to be more on their side than they are on ours. Well, this, is, this belongs to another question. This is Israeli PR, or what we call the Asbara, but I, I would rather leave yeah. this to, I think, another discussion. I think that... The, the difficulty that we are witnessing now is mainly twofold. One is the fight against Hamas, who is controlling Gaza. And I don't see a, 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 a solution that could end that conflict. This is containment, as Ehud Barak suggested, with um, eruption of violence every few years. Until Hamas is either replaced by the people and not taken down by Israel. It could not have, this could, will never happen. And this Israel conquer Gaza and this will never happen. And the other, uh, of course, the other challenge is with the Palestinian Authority. Um, the Palestinian Authority is doing quite a lot to reduce violence. But I think that if we will continue, and I'm not looking for someone to blame for that, but if we will continue to have a non-existent peace accord, sooner or later, and I think it will happen sooner, we will witness the third intifada, the frustration of the people from not giving whatever they got with some domestic serious issue inside the Palestinian people will lead to a third intifada. And as in the first and the second, everybody will say, well, how come we didn't see that before? And after it gets its act together, will the Israeli intelligence services and the Mossad be ready, and will they succeed? As long as we are talking about focused challenge, meaning that scientist, that pr project, that um, nucleus of jihadist terrorism, 
I think that they are, they are extremely, extremely good. Possibly, I think, the best one in the world. When we are talking about the ability to control masses, as in the Third Intifada, I think that they have very little to do. There are very little that can be done except for a, some sort of, of, of diplomatic process. We have run out of time. I'm so sorry. He's going to be signing books. But please thank Renan Bergman. Thank you. And get his books. Thank you.